Hi, I'm Rob Hersov. I'm the founder and chairman of Invest Africa and African Capital Investments and a few other companies. I lived outside of South Africa in America and Europe, mainly the UK, for 31 years, but two years ago, I came home. Okay, so Nanga asked me for some comments on the interview we just had. Um, firstly, he didn't prepare me for anything. He did say it would be an expose of my life and some thoughts about business and being an entrepreneur and things that I've done, but didn't give me the topics, and, uh, which is quite interesting because you have to actually then react, flow, and he was very good about allowing me to speak, but redirecting me when uh, I was going on a bit too long or I was possibly going off piste. But then when I had an anecdote or something that I felt was relevant, he let me roll with that. Um, I thought the, the, short, the fast fire questions at the end were excellent because uh, un I was unprepared for it. He didn't tell me what they were, but that really draws you out and uh, makes you think on your feet. <laughs> uh, I've got some little anecdotes or sayings that I like to work in and I had the chance to work some of those in and they were very relevant because Nanga gave me the opportunity. So I enjoyed it. I hope you all got something out of it. And, you know, it's a learning experience for me too. Well, good morning, Rob. Thank, Thank you very much for joining me today. Great pleasure. Um, you're on The Voice of Pursuit Show, um, in which we're trying to educate, inspire, and connect people through, through active learning. Great to be here, Nanga. Thank you. Deeply appreciate it. So, Rob, um, I think first things first, for those of you who don't know, I've done my research. <laughs> um, Co-founder Marquis, Sportal, CEO of um, Enoch, Econ Group, and a number of other things. But I think if we dial back the clock and we start to early childhood, um, where did the journey all begin? Um, what was the upbringing before you became the extraordinary entrepreneur you are? Yeah. Well, unlike most entrepreneurs, you start with nothing. I was born into one of the um, wealthiest families in South Africa. And mm. I often say to people, it is what it is. It is, you know? it is what it is. But it's, and it's what you, what you make of your life and what you do with what you're given. And I was given a lot. I was given you know, great parents, great family, loving family, you know, the, the best education money could buy. Mm -hmm. You know, I really was given every privilege imaginable. So hopefully I've done credit to my parents and my family <laughs> and my friends. But I was born in Johannesburg. My grandfather founded Angloval, which was at its time one of the great mining industrial companies, which my father then ran. And, you know, I went to Ridge, Michael House, UCT, <coughs> and then after doing military service, which was compulsory in those days, mm -hmm. I decided to go and leave to find fame and fortune in the outside world. And that was in 1985 that I went overseas. And where was the first destination you went to? And I know you did your MBA at Harvard. So if yeah. we dive a bit into that, how was that? How did we yeah. get to, to, to going from Harvard and you know, the growth from there? So I went to Goldman Sachs, New York for two years as an investment banker, and then I went to Harvard Business School. And it was, you know, difficult times for South Africa then. South Africa mm. was about to go through its transformation to democracy. And I went there and it said on my Facebook, and a Facebook in those days with pieces of paper, it said, you know, investment banker Goldman Sachs, infantry officer, South African Defense Force. And, you know, a lot of people there didn't make the effort to ask me if I was pro or for or what was going on. They just said, this has got to be a bad guy. Mm. But I did turn up there after f a three-month holiday <laughs> with very long blonde hair, looking like some rebellious surfer. <laughs> so it wasn't basically the liberals who were mad at me. It was also a lot of the guys from the Midwest said, this guy's a hippie, we're not talking to him. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but Harvard Business School is an extraordinary place, and it really opened my mind. And I was a late maturer intellectually, and mm. it took, you know, I was kind of behind the ball at school, started to catch up at UCT. But at Harvard Business School, I came into my own, and that really opened my mind to business and the opportunities of the world. So were you always thinking about going into business, um, obviously doing the MBA, or were you, was it a family, was it imposed by family, listen, well, we've got to move up, do the MBA, move on to? I grew up in a business family with, with business as the core, and you know, it, it really, there was no choice. I mean, I suppose it's what I wanted to do, mm. but I could have chosen do law, don't be a lawyer. Do mm. accounting, don't be an accountant. Do engineering, don't be an engineer. Sure. Translate that knowledge into business. But I chose to go into business to become a businessman. Correct. 
So then moving on to Goldman Sachs, was that knowingly going into getting the experience from Goldman Sachs, meeting, networking, and taking that knowledge and then moving on to yourself? Or was it just testing the fields because I'm in the States and Goldman Sachs is the company it is? No, I think, you know, having finished you know, an undergraduate university in military service, you know, the one great opportunity for anyone in this world is to work for a big mm. corporate, and particularly a big American corporate, because they train you. Mm. And it's, it's very difficult to start as an entrepreneur and then join a big corporate, Correct. or be in a small company and go to a big company. It doesn't work that way. Correct. It's better and good advice for people. If you leave university, mm. find a business that's going to train you. Mm. And the big businesses, you know, the McKinsey's, the Goldman Sachs, the Procter & Gamble, the Amgen's, the pharma companies, train you so well. Okay. And that's your one chance. Join a big corporate in America if you can. All right. So grew up, left SA, went to the States, did the MBA at Harvard, Goldman Sachs. What was happening then? What was the next decision? Yeah. Well, after I did Goldman before Harvard Business School, but okay. after Harvard Business School, my two bits of advice on hiring is try and join a company that will hire, hire you and train you well, okay. or work for the most inspirational individual you know or you've heard of. And after Harvard Business School, I was looking at the big corporates, but the one man who was making waves worldwide was Rupert Murdoch. Mm. And I was dating a girl at the time who knew someone on Murdoch's board of directors, who funnily enough I saw last week in New York, <laughs> and I told him the story. And I said, look, I really want to be in the media business. And he said, mm. well, you should then meet Rupert Murdoch. Okay. And he got me an interview with Rupert Murdoch. And basically I said one word. I went and shook his hand and he said, please sit down, Rob. Tell me, what do you think the future of the media business is? And I went, technology. And he went, no, you're wrong. It's content. <laughs> <laughs> and then he spoke for 20 minutes about the future of media. And the end of him speaking, I'd said one word, technology. Mm. He said, okay, you're hired. Uh, what are you going to do for me? And I said, well, I want to work for you as your right-hand man for the next few years. Do you think that's a key, a key trait and what people should look into when they want to work in a big company or work for someone is, firstly, what I could pick up from this was I was an active listener. I sat in the meeting. I listened. I let him speak. And then, secondly, I just followed up. And, yeah. you know, well, actually, I didn't get a word in edgeways. <laughs> once I'd said the wrong word, technology, he'd explained to me that there's actually content. Okay. I didn't say any more. But... Either get a company that's going to train you properly mm. or work for somebody who's going to spend the time making you the person you ought to be. All right. So someone inspirational, like Rupert Murdoch, or the team leader who's mm. just someone that's going to try and make you a success. Okay. That'll make all the difference. Wonderful. After Goldman Sachs, I've got my experience. I've learned from Rupert. What, what, next? Was, what was the next step? Well, funny enough, Johan Rupert... South African heard there was a South African working as Rupert Murdoch's right hand man and Rupert Murdoch was going from strength to strength mm. so he called me and said would I meet him and I had a meeting with him the families actually knew each other but he didn't know me that well mm. and he was looking for a third leg to his business he had tobacco luxury goods and he was looking to build a third leg to the Richmond empire and he decided correctly then that it should be a business that had barriers to entry like pay television so he brought me and put me on the board of Richemont at age 32 to drive a new direction for the business, which we did. And over six years, he and I and Richemont built the third largest pay television business in Europe, which I ended up running from Milan in Italy as a South African. Mm. And uh, that, those are stories on their own. But um, we successfully built the business and successfully sold it to Canal Plus. And that was the end of my corporate life. What do you think made it such a big success? Firstly, he's a highly intelligent man, Johan Rupert. He is a, he's one of the great businessmen walking the world. I mean, he has insights and skills and wisdom, and he's a risk taker. Mm. Um, and he saw the opportunity, and he put the right people in place around me and around him to make it happen. But it still was a very risky business. Great. Okay. Biggest takeaway from that lesson in growing the company? You never have enough information to make a decision but you need to make decisions because momentum is everything. You've got a whole lot of people in a company waiting for decisions to be made and it's just not good enough to say, I'm not going to make a decision until I have more information because everything grinds to halt. Mm. You have information, make a rational decision and move because sometimes momentum is more important than making the right decision. Okay. 
correct and you don't want to stagnate through that exactly so cool i've learned what i've done i've grown this company quite successful you're at age 32 but old enough 30, but old, 38 38 yeah. and you're now going to build your own startup correct so, so how did the ideating behind that go what were yeah. your thoughts behind it before you started it and then to then initially going live at the point. Exactly. The so at that point at age 38, the internet was starting to happen. Everyone was starting to notice it. No one knew what it was. But I had specific relationships and skills. I had skills in media, some technology, sport, because as a pay television business, we were buying and distributing a lot of sports rights. And I got to know the heads of football companies in Europe, mm. football clubs. And so I formed Sportal, which was a sports portal. And we had and no one ever believes this, but we had the exclusive rights in perpetuity, which is illegal now, or not legal now, mm. to wireless and internet, and people didn't really know what wireless was, or internet, to the following clubs, in. Juventus, AC Milan, Paris Saint-Germain, Real Madrid, um, Bayern Munich, and 20 others. If I'd sat on those rights and done nothing, <laughs> I'd be the richest South African today. I can but, imagine, congrats yeah. on that. Well, no, if I had. Yeah. <laughs> but, but so we raised a lot of money, built up the business. We probably grew too fast, hired too many people. Um, you know, broadband hadn't arrived yet. We, we were kind of the leading edge of the internet yeah. and didn't know where it was. We were the pioneers. Yeah. And 9-11 came, already the internet crash had begun and that basically wiped out our business. So. My first big failure was Portal. Where were you that night or that day? What are the thoughts running behind your head and what were you thinking about going forward? Well, I was on my way to the European Cup final in Rotterdam, 2000-2001. I was sitting next to a friend of mine, Steve Nuttall, who worked for me. Everyone opened the Sunday Times and on the front page of the business section it said, number one internet business in Europe. Sportal and had pictures of us and as people came onto the plane they were looking at that picture picture looking at us going that's the guy and I turned to Stephen I already knew we had problems mm. in the company I turned to him and says <laughs> it's downhill from here because we knew you know the end was coming Correct. so the worst part of it of all was actually having to lay off all the great fantastic people that mm. had joined the company and were working with me but you know if you hire properly you need to fire properly or lay, or lay people off with respect Correct. and that was a very difficult time because I went from hero to zero in a very short period of time and it takes a lot of it takes a lot of emotion emotion pressure. correct well you don't want your family to feel threatened mm. you know your investors are now gonna lose their money you've spent four years of your life building something that's a failure there's a lot of dynamics going on. So what is the thought process behind that? What were you thinking and how did you find like you were going to get through it all? You just have to suck it in in the morning and go mm. and make it happen. But the key is to try and sleep. Because we, you know, if you don't get sleep, you don't operate properly. And that's one physiological thing that I believe in. You know, I need my... You know you hear these people that do yeah. four hours sleep. I don't think that's, that's not good for you. I need my seven. I don't believe it I either. I need my seven. Yeah. I don't believe it either. But, you know, when that had happened, I started to think to myself, what next? And, mm. you know, in America, failure is seen as a positive thing. You learn way more with failure than you do with success. A lot of rich, successful people have been one-trick ponies. They got lucky. Mm. And I got unlucky. Mm. You know, I did do the right things. I got unlucky. The timing was wrong. But right. I learned a huge amount. And that's followed through with me. Which then you've carried over into Marquis Jet. Well, that's what I thought. The next business, what do I do? I thought enough of sports and media technology. Mm. What's around forever? Rich people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there are always rich people. Correct. And I knew more than my share of rich people. Mm. So I thought, what business can I build based on rich people? Private jets. Mm. You know, there's finance, there's insurance, there's houses. But the one thing the one thing that changes your life is a private jet. If you have a Ferrari and I've got a Bucky, mm. we're still cut, stuck in the same traffic. Correct. But if you've got a private jet and I'm flying commercial, oh my gosh, your life is a better life than mine. Bucky. And I've heard that. Yeah. And I've really That's, heard that. Warren Buffett said it. He said the one and only thing that changes life in a major way is, a private, is private aviation. Mm. So I founded Marquee Jet as an on-seller of net jets. And that business, I'm happy to say, was a big success. And to this day, 19 years later, I'm still in the private aviation business. I'm deputy chairman oh, of VistaJet, mm. 
and VistaJet is the second largest private aviation fleet, uh, second only to NetJet, but more profitable than NetJet and growing faster than NetJet. It's been a huge success. And it's all worked out. It's all, all that has worked out well. And through this journey from Johannesburg to, to Marquis Jet, I think, what would, what would you say has been the biggest takeaway and the lesson? Because you've switched, you've gone from corporate, you've done your own yeah. startups to a successful startup, from one that failed to one that's now succeeded. What would you think has been the biggest takeaway from that? So now I've launched a, a number of other businesses, Invest Africa, Correct. African Capital Investments, and more recently, Alternative Capital, Altcap, all three finance businesses, or finance-related business, two focused on Africa. And the lesson that I've learned is, I love small businesses. Mm. Any business that has more than 22 employees is very difficult to manage. Correct. Under 22 employees, you know everyone. And you know what they're doing and you know their strengths and weaknesses. The other thing is, my lesson to any entrepreneur is, hire people better than yourself at all times. I'm always trying to make myself redundant. Because mm. once I'm redundant in a business, that business is running properly and it's got the right people running it and I can step back and do my next business. Correct. So in love with the startup, and I think you've just mentioned it now, Invest Africa, so that's your most recent yeah. um, founded on the chairman, the chairman of Invest Africa. Can we speak a bit more about Invest Africa? What is it about, you have then now relocated back from London back to South to Africa, South Africa yeah. to, to start Invest Africa. So if we can get a bit of an intro sure. to that and what it's about. So Invest Africa is now five years old, and the best way to describe it is a connectivity network for investors in Africa. You know, there are 52, 54 countries in Africa, mm. I said 52, 54 countries in Africa, different languages, different cultures, different ambitions, different governance. For an American or a foreigner, it's almost impossible to decipher the good from the bad, the opportunity from the, you know, the, the dog. Mm, mm. And what we try and do is sensibly evangelize investment in Africa. Right. So, you know, I always think of a mid-American who thinks Africa is a country <laughs> and say to them, there's 54 countries, Correct. here are the ones I'd invest in, Correct. here are the ones I'd avoid for the moment, here are the sectors I like, here are the ones I don't like. So I like to synthesize this complicated story into a simple investment thesis. And that's what we do. We do a lot of events, conferences, VIP trips to Africa. We connect the dots. We put great entrepreneurs together with great capital providers. And we make things simple. We I'm make correct Africa, in saying. And we, evan we sensibly evangelize investment. All right. If I'm correct in saying you connect dynamic capital with dynamic opportunities. You said it better than me. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, awesome. So yeah. over the past five years, what has been exciting? What have been the biggest investments? And what are the next coming biggest opportunities for yeah. investors that want to know? So for me, energy is the driver mm -hmm. and the handbrake. You know, we need gig many more gigawatts in Africa to fuel education, healthcare. You know, any economic opportunity needs electricity, needs power. So to me, that's the most exciting and biggest driver of economic growth in Africa. And there's a huge deficit of power and electricity. So that, to me, is the number one sector. And is this a matter of connecting investors with government? Is this private firms that should be opening up? What is your take on it? It's a combination of them. In some countries, like South Africa, you've got an ESCOM that you have to deal with. Correct. Which is good and it's bad. It's good that if you can get things done, one efficient provider and distributor. In most cases, you're dealing with governments in Africa, and there's some governments are better than others. So, you know, for example, Senegal mm. has delivered an incredible amount of number of megawatts for its country in a short period of time. Mm. It's a very efficient country. Morocco, superb. Mm. Kenya, getting its act together. Ghana, mm. you know, these are countries that are doing the right thing. Um, and we should be proud of them. Rwanda is obviously the, you know, one of the best countries in Africa to do business. So when people, foreigners say, oh, Africa's risky, Correct. I'd say, no. I'd say the risk, the risk, the corruption is worse in India and China and Russia than it is in most African countries. Mm. You know, in Africa, there's perceived risk and real risk. And real risk is way lower than perceived risk. Correct. You can do great business in Africa. Correct. So in the next five to ten years, where do you see 
the growth of the African continent's, continent's economy yeah. and what are, which countries are the biggest drivers in that? So human capital is everything. All right. We have such untapped human capital in Africa and it's not just the reverse diaspora of mm. Africans that have gone overseas to be educated or work for great companies and are returning, but it's the local extraordinary entrepreneurs that you meet in Cape Town, in Chailiche, in Johannesburg, in Accra, in Nairobi. Mm. It's incredible, the talent. So what excites me is that there are people doing things in Africa that can be taken internationally. Correct. That excites me the most. Businesses that can be tested in Africa, in African countries, mm. but are actually meant for the international market. And I'm looking for those businesses. Awesome. Is there one that sticks out for you in particular? <laughs> well, I've got my own one that I'm working on, but awesome. you know, I spent this morning uh, with some very smart people looking into artificial intelligence, AI. All right. And I think that that's going to be a great leveler. You know, there's no reason why somebody from Senegal or somebody from Rwanda or Kenya or South Africa can't come up with the next unicorn. Correct. And in AI, you know, the, it's not just Google with all its data that's going to dominate. It's going to be human capital and smart right. people. Correct. The access to information that we have and access yeah. to the tools Everything and resources that we possible. have. Yeah. And what excites me is, you know, the great professors of the world mm. don't have to just lecture to a classroom. Mm. They can lecture to the world. You this can have access to the best professors sitting in a village in somewhere in Africa. This is all very exciting, yeah. actually. Yeah. Um, I think more on a, on a personal level, um, and you've obviously been questioning this, surely, this Chinese or you know, mm. the Chinese investing into Africa yeah. and leveraging of those opportunities. What are your thoughts on those? You know, a lot of people you know, are scared of China, fearful, you know, angry. Mm. My view is, thank you, China, mm. for kicking off this investment in Africa you know, 10, 15 years ago. You know, they created the initial rush in Africa. And admittedly, the first wave of investment, China took advantage of African governments. Correct. You know, they'd give Zambia, for example, mm. you know, a railway station, an airport, a bus terminal worth hypothetically $500 million. Mm -hmm. But in exchange, they'd give $2 billion of resources. Mm. So they ripped us off. <laughs> but you know what? We weren't awake. We weren't ready. Correct. The second phase was then Chinese coming into Africa and doing substandard construction, using their own employees mm. and not our people, you know, again, ripping us off. But we've now worked out how to use them and how to do better negotiating with the Chinese. And they're bringing money and they're getting things done. So Correct. I say, thank you, China. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm obviously pro-West, as I should be, but China's at least made the effort and it's woken up. Japan's moving quicker. Germany's trying to get its act together. Correct. You know, the Brits and the Americans are investing I'm more. Starting to it's good see for us. It is. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, again, and what I've noticed from you, Robbie, you're an opportunist, um, an optimist. You're, you're always looking at the positive side of things. And I guess at the end of the day, like you're saying, it's thank you, Trump, for actually investing into the continent because did you not, others wouldn't have awoken to the opportunities that you're missing out on. And that's where Invest Africa comes in once again. Correct. And, you know, there's one th way of looking at the world that I love. It's life is a mystery to be lived, mm. not a problem to be solved. So I wake up in the morning and I'm always grateful for what I've been given in life and what I have in front of me. Mm. And things do happen. You know, you get unlucky or you get sick or something happens that you can't control. But I'm grateful to be here. and I'm really grateful for what I've been given and what lies ahead. Correct. I feel like life always works in your favour. And if you, if you play towards and you play the chords right... Yeah. And you have a smile on your face. <laughs> <laughs> things you manifest themselves. You know the interesting thing is when I travel around Africa... Yes. And you know, you're coming up to a border post or you're meeting a group of people. You put a smile on your face. Africans respond more than anyone, any other people in the world. They smile you back and there you go. Correct. And I've and seen this in Tanzania yeah. when I travelled yeah. there. Because the people there are lovely. Um, so... You know, you said you woke up, you wake up in the mornings and you feel grateful. Are you so part of this whole self-development? You know, you've got to have this routine and this routine. <laughs> what what does Rob Hersov do? Yeah. Um, what does your day to days look like? And do you have a morning routine yeah. or a day routine, shall I say? Funny you should mention it, but it developed only relatively recently in the last ten years. I need my seven eight hours sleep. I'd like to go to bed early. 
Mm -hmm. I don't ever, I'm never up beyond midnight. So I'm in bed by nine, asleep by 10, up by five or six. Mm. And then the, from the morning to lunch, I'm the most productive. Right. And so I use that time. I do try to meditate, getting better at it. <laughs> <laughs> I do exercise. I try to exercise every day, even for a long walk. Mm. Um, funny enough, I'm starting yoga, I'm a bit nervous about that. It's interesting. <laughs> so, and then I'm a minimalist. So I don't own watches, jewelry. I give away most of my books. We don't have much. I mean, the house, this is a nice house, but we don't have any expensive art. Mm. I don't own any possessions own you. Mm. And I always wear the same thing. If you look at all if you do, yeah. media, <laughs> if you search yeah. on Google, know, you it looks like see. I haven't changed. <laughs> <laughs> You've done five yeah. back to back to back. But, but I love the simplicity. I can pack my life up into three suitcases. Right. And to my wife and I, we love wonderful experiences, nice houses and mm. cash in the bank. Correct. Those are the three things. But the wonderful experiences, you know, we want memories for the rocking chair. Mm. So, amazing career has capitalized on all the opportunities. Um, luck played the part in you being in the right place at the right time. What would you accredit to? Would you were you always doing self development? I think that's number one. And number two is what do you think entrepreneurs and CEOs and business need, leaders need to capitalize on and work on themselves or what do they need to do yeah. to work on themselves? so the self-development's come much later in life all right you know i've made my mistakes uh, overdone certain things underdone other things i think being too structured is not a good thing mm -hmm. you know if you're up every morning at the same time you always do yoga at the same time and you, mm -hmm. you know you become a bit of a predictable animal a robot yeah a robot yeah and that's not good but then again running wild also doesn't <laughs> also you have to have discipline and structure and focus right. and what what i do love is the is people that have a positive attitude mm. and a sense of humor and if you you, you, you shouldn't worry this sweat the small stuff is the great right. expression don't yeah. sweat the small stuff here's a lovely expression that a friend of mine dermot desmond Irish, he's a, he's a philosopher in his own way. Worry only has the force you give it. Mm. So in many ways, a lot of what we worry about is stuff we shouldn't even worry about. Correct. You know, just own it or suck it in and forget about it. Correct. The big stuff, yeah. You know, life and death, health, family, you know, that you care about. But the little stuff, don't sweat it. Correct. You know. All right. Well, thank you very much. Great pleasure. Um, yeah. I think I've learned a lot from you. I think the viewers have learned a lot from you as well. The growth of who you've become and who you're and still, still going to, to be. <laughs> exactly. Because this yeah. is not the end. No, it's um, the beginning. Correct. Yeah. Even with, I'm sure you've thought of a couple of other startups that you'd like to start yeah. as well. I, I like to joke and I say to, you know, I'm 59 this year. And I like to say to people who are starting their career, you know, if I ask you what you want to do in life and you tell me I don't know yet, mm. that's probably the right answer because I haven't worked out what I want to do yet. Right. <laughs> right. Right. There's, a, there's a stigma on that you need to know everything right now. Just wake up every day and do Take the best day you by can. Day. Take it day by right. day. All right, so I want to fire off five, let me say two questions and then towards the end after that I want to okay. fire off five words and i would like your thoughts on it so okay. you'll just say i'll say a word to you and you say one back okay i think let's start off with the two questions first your business philosophy my business philosophy is focus on the long term and i only learned this over quite a long period of time if you know don't try and score a goal from the get-go mm. just build up to that goal and take your time because life is a marathon not a sprint and it's very hard to realize that in your early days mm. and in your later days you think I haven't got enough time left just think that you're gonna live forever and build block by block take your time it's taken me a long time to learn that wonderful last question if you could dial back the clock I'm pretty sure you're obviously going to say I don't think I'll change anything but if you could dial back the clock what is one thing that you would redo and why I suppose when I look at the world, I mean, I don't really have any regrets. I mean, I've been, had to live a very lucky life, so mm. I'm blessed and mm. I'm very grateful. But I think 
America is the superpower and has been all my life and will continue for, I think, still quite a lot longer. I think if I had stayed there and built my businesses there, I would have built much bigger, much more profitable, much more successful businesses. Mm. Whether I'd be happy, I have no idea. But I just think, you know, it's such a big market. Correct. And I think I should have spent longer being an American building businesses there. Right. Awesome. So we'll get into the last segment now. In the five, five words, you'll just respond back what they mean to you. Freedom. Freedom is controlling your own schedule. You know, if you're able to decide what you do that day or move the schedule around to suit yourself, mm. you have the greatest freedom of any human being on the planet. Mm. Most people don't have that. They have a nine to five, they have responsibilities where they're obliged to do things. Correct. Africa. Africa is where my heart is. I love that Standard Bank ad that says, they call it Africa, we call it home. Mm. And for the 31 years I lived abroad, I pined to come back here. That's wonderful. And it's lots of little things. It's the people, it's the smiles, it's the smell of the earth when the rain comes down. Mm. You know, that, particularly up in the high felt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a high felt boy. It's the smells, it's the sounds. I and mean, it just, it, it, in, it's in my blood. Sure. Yeah. Money. Money. Money is important. Mm -hmm. It can't be the be all and end all, but it is important. Money That's buys right. you freedom. Correct. Money gives you the ability to control your life. So, and and it and it, it is the way one, you know, marks oneself in the business community. Correct. But there's a certain amount of money, and you don't need any more. Mm. And I have a rough idea of what that is. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah. Family. Family. Um, often people driving themselves in business neglect family a bit. Mm. And there's a very different role, mother and father. But I think at this point in my life, with my second family, mm. uh, seven and a four-year-old, I have the opportunity to do it better. But I'm very proud of my older sons. They have That's an wonderful. independence and a strength that I don't think I had at that age. So it's fascinating to have 21, 22 and a 19-year-old, seven mm. and a four-year-old. The age and gap and seeing that, and that growth. Here's the one thing that I sh really should mention. People spend months and years doing due diligence on businesses being put together, but they'll marry a girl <laughs> overnight. overnight. <laughs> and yet, your love, your wife, your husband, your partner, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your soulmate is the most important Correct. decision you make in your life. Correct. And, and that's got to be the biggest business opportunity of all, to try and pair people more effectively. If anyone yeah. wants a new business yeah. idea. <laughs> and I'll do it with you. <laughs> <laughs> and lastly, yeah. business. Yeah. What is that to you? Business is my hobby. It's what I do. It's what I enjoy. I actually love looking at meeting entrepreneurs, looking at businesses and going, wow, mm. that's impressive. I wish I'd done that or I could do that better. Or looking at a failure and going, how could I have averted that? It's my hobby. I love it. And I love to see what's coming. Robotics, artificial intelligence. Blockchain, cryptocurrencies, mm. med tech, healthcare. Wow, so, you know, education, exciting. educating the world. It's so exciting. 50% of the people being born today will live beyond 100 years. I agree what does with that, that mean? I agree with that. It's so exciting. It is. Indeed. Everything's a business opportunity. It is. Rob, thank you very much for joining thank us you. today. I deeply yeah. appreciate your time. Great pleasure. I think that everyone's learned a lot as well. And I wish you all the best for the rest Thank of your you. ventures. Great. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Cheers. You.